Sarah Costa is our speaker this afternoon, and she is the executive director of the Women's Refugee Commission. She is responsible for the organization's research and advocacy work, all that's necessary to protect and empower women, children, and youth who have been displaced by conflict and crisis. Sarah, I'd just like to begin by asking you just to talk a little bit about the global refugee crisis as you see it today. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that numbers are staggering. When you think about 65.3 million have been forced to flee their homes, these numbers are unprecedented. We haven't seen such numbers since perhaps the Second World War, or when, in fact, when registration first started. So we're coping in the humanitarian system with great numbers. And if you think about it, this may actually help understand the dimension of the problem. One in 122 people across the world have been forced to flee. That's incredible. The majority are women and children. I mean, in some settings, it's 80%. Some in 70, 75%, in part because so many men are killed in conflict. But I mean, the numbers for us in this day are really difficult. But I think it's also important to point out another, a couple of things that a lot of people don't realize. We're dealing with a very different humanitarian crisis today. Over 60% of people that are forced to flee end up in urban areas, in non-camp settings. Yet the humanitarian system was actually designed to provide and deliver services to people in camps. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, the other thing is that the average length of displacement is something around 20 years. So when we think about the humanitarian system, it was really set up to save lives, you know, quick acting interventions, short term interventions. Today, we are really forced to think about what do we do to really build stability, resilience of the population that are fleeing. And they, as I say, on average are displaced many years. There are cases of women who are giving birth to children today that actually were born in camps. And we're seeing people in, in urban areas that are so hard to reach because it isn't a camp setting, yet we've advocated a lot against camp settings because people are confined and don't have freedom of movement. So we're dealing with a very, very different world. Well, it's right that we talk about refugees, but as you said, so many of them are women and children. Maybe you could just give us a little background about the Women's Refugee Commission, how it was mm -hmm. founded, why, and its mission. Well, it was founded almost 30 years ago, and it was founded by a group of women who were um, attached or part of the board of the International Rescue Committee, the IRC. And one of the reasons it was founded, because the, the board members would go to the field and they would see that even women's most basic needs were not being addressed. They were delivering in fields without any um, health um, services being provided. They were struggling to get food because the lines of food, men would push them out of the way. And so the organization really was founded to start to think about how do we better meet the needs of women and children? And we've been doing this for many years. We are a research and advocacy organization. We're an organization that's really trying to push the humanitarian community to better address the needs of women and children. So this means sort of more specific programs and really trying to provide that evidence base for change. What groups do you work with to collect the evidence and what do you do once you have the evidence? Well, we work um, a lot in partnership. And for, to us, it's key because we're research and advocacy and we don't have a presence on the ground. We're not a service <coughs> delivery organization. We are the people that are pushing very hard and telling 
the agencies that are responsible for care, you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to push on this front. You need to make sure women are safe. Why aren't you doing the basic things you need to do? Um, we partner and we partner with a lot of the UN agencies in our work. We partner with the large um, service delivery organizations like IRC, like the Norwegian Refugee Council, like Mercy Car, Save, UNICEF, etc. And um, our success really is because we're seen, um, we have a particular niche, and we're seen as somebody that can actually help them improve their programs. What are the biggest obstacles that you um, are faced with when trying to address the needs of these women? I mean, there's tremendous sort of gender bias. Um, women are often not seen as, as important you know, um, players in the field as um, men. In refugee camps, women have much less access to decision making and leadership. Women get raped every day going out to collect firewood, yet this doesn't seem to be at the top of the agenda for many people. And when you see what happens in sub-Sahara Africa, where women make the choice of who they're going to send out of a camp to collect firewood each day, it's heartbreaking. And the fact is that it's not necessarily seen as a key problem because it's a woman's problem, it's a woman's issue. They are responsible for caring for the family. They are responsible for cooking a meal without water. They are responsible for finding enough firewood. And it may take them eight hours a day to find enough firewood to cook the meal for the family. And I think that gets translated up to the humanitarian community. I'm not saying everyone in the humanitarian community doesn't prioritize women, but when you look at progress on gender equality programming, it's pretty dismal. And we're fighting very hard to get it to the top of the agenda. And could you talk a little bit about the unaccompanied children who also, the figures are astounding that the numbers, I think Europol reported that there are 10,000 unaccompanied children refugees have gone missing in Europe this year. I mean, yeah, that's I, extraordinary. I think that there's not a lot of um, data on what's actually happening, but one of the things I can tell you that in one of the camps um, in Greece, um, the huge gaps in the fence that circles the camp. And women are reporting that their kids are getting abducted and trafficked at night. They can't stop men coming in, they're big holes in the fence. Certainly when I was on the European trail along through Serbia and Slovenia, what was happening is it was such chaos that a lot of the children got separated from their parents. People were getting off trains, thousands of people getting off trains, having to register. And in that kind of chaos, children get lost. And there just weren't enough systems and, and cross-border systems to be able to identify these kids and make sure they were linked up to their families. But people are saying they're also disappearing from reception centers and from other services that have been set up. So it's a dire situation, and I think that we need to do much more research on what's happening to those kids, and we need to understand if they're being trafficked, then the people that sort of research this, they have to come into the, into the pool of people who are responding to this crisis. Has any progress been made? I mean, it sounds so dire. I was just curious to whether or not you've I seen mean, any overall, progress. Overall, in the humanitarian community, I think we've made quite a lot of progress. And we certainly, over the last 30 years, we've developed quite good guidance. We've uh, how to address the needs of women and children. We've also got very good guidance on how to prevent gender-based violence. We have a lot of tools. We have a lot of models that have been tested. I think the biggest problem we face, or one of the biggest problems, is that so often these don't get implemented. There's a huge gap between policy and implementation on the ground. And I believe that this needs to be tackled head on because we can't afford to be failing in this way. And so I, mean, I believe that one of the, the areas that needs to really change in the humanitarian system so that we become more effective 
and more transparent in what we do is to involve local organizations in the response. If you look at the situation for women and girls in particular, a lot of the local organizations in the countries that are either hosting refugees or transit countries, refugees are passing through, the NGO world is very well equipped to respond to gender-based violence. They're very well equipped to provide basic reproductive health care, delivery care, family planning that women so, so badly need along these refugee or migration routes. We need to build these new partnerships and new alliances because I think this is how we're also going to, which I think is essential, increase accountability in our field. Well, I think that's a big problem, accountability mm. and whether yep. or not certain governments want to open up. I mean, it seems to me there's more of a push now to close their borders. So the priorities then would be to try to make people more aware, the governments more aware, and hopefully that you'll be successful with resettling some of these refugees. Could you talk maybe about some wonderful cases where you've resettled refugees who've come out of these camps so we can end on a more positive note? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the projects that I, really resonates with me has been some work we've been doing in Jordan, in Zarqa, um, which is an industrial area. And what we've been doing is working with the, the local women's associations and we have been providing small grants to women so that they can set up almost like cottage industries. And it's about them finding, these are women who've never worked, never been out of home, have no financial literacy skills. And so they're coming into these centers and they're also working side by side with poor Jordanians, which is incredibly important so that we start to address that backlash that is happening in a number of these host communities. But the project has provided small grants to women and it's really about leveraging their skills. So there's a wonderful case of a woman who had a recipe to make vinegar. It came from her great grandmother and she started to make vinegar in her home. She now employs eight refugees, because as you know, in most places, refugees can't legally work, so they have to move into the informal sector. And she's employing eight women, and they go around their community selling vinegar. I mean, there are lots of other examples of soap and cleaning products, but when you see how providing just a few resources and tools to women, they can fly. They can build um, a community around them. And so I, I firmly believe that there is a lot that can be done. You know, social and economic empowerment of women is key. Getting women into leadership positions in some of these refugee communities is absolutely key to changing the dynamic and making sure, actually, that more money comes to address women's issues, to promoting gender equality in their communities. And so if they're not sitting at the table where decisions are made, it's also not going to change. So what was the formula that made it so successful in Jordan that can't be you know, duplicated in Lebanon or Turkey? Or I mean, this is a very good question because it's something I personally struggle with every day. When we have good models, what's stopping us from scaling up? And I think what, when we look at the humanitarian system, right across the system and the service providers, what we see are pockets of very good work, but not necessarily are these connected, not necessarily is that information shared, and not necessarily do we get the resources. Just to give you an idea, it's in the one-digit figure the amount of money that goes to promoting gender equality and women's empowerment of the total budget. So this is in part one of the problems, is the allocation of funding. And so you see these pockets, you see these good models, and we have to keep pushing to scale that up. One of the things that I think um, that's going to be important is a piece of um, research that we're doing. We're trying to develop an index that really sort of measures resilience. If we're all trying to build resilience and have long-term solutions to the problem of being a refugee displaced for 20 years, what are the components that really make a difference in people's <coughs> lives? And one of them is actually having access to a job 
to an income generating activity. The other is education for their children. So we're starting to quantify this as a way of using it as an advocacy tool to really change the dynamic of funding within the humanitarian community. You mentioned several times that uh, the women and children uh, are likely to spend 20 years in the refugee camp in this uh, area of suspended animation, really. Are they just living from day to day, or do they have a sense of their future? I think it very much depends on the situation they are in. I mean, the, some of the recent interviews that we did with Syrian women, um, refugees from Syria in Greece, some of them actually said that they prefer to go back and die in their own country because the conditions are so bad, right? So obviously there's not much hope. But if you look at some of the refugees that were settled on the Thai Burma border, they have, you know, they have established their lives there. They have a lot of hope. They, they've got access to far more services. So I think it very much depends. But one of the things I can share with you is that I've just come back from what the youth consultations. Um, every year, the UN Refugee Agency um, has a theme, and they bring in NGOs to actually give them, to, to talk, to consult with them, etc. And this year, the theme was youth. And what we did is we took 30 young people, refugees, from all around the world to Geneva to actually talk to the humanitarian agencies. And they had such a strong message of hope. There was this one young man from Aleppo. He's on his own in Germany in terrible conditions, but he really believes that he can make a difference having been in a network of other young people, that he now has that support. And the women in the, or the young women in this group were very energetic, committed. They, so I think it's also related to age. I think if you've lived in displacement for many, many years and you've seen some of the horrors of it, perhaps you do give up. Um, but on the other hand, my experience with women is they will do anything to survive, to support their families. And so I think that it doesn't take much to give them hope, but some of them have lost it. Most of the refugees follow Islam. How does that impact how services are provided and how the camp is operated? Urban areas are different, but in many of the camps, that is taken into account. And so many of the service providers um, are of the same faith and can support and relate to the group. I think one of the difficulties, of course, is that you see an opportunity in those situations to perhaps empower women and girls in a way that may conflict with the dominant religion of that community. And that is a little bit difficult. So one of the things we do a lot is obviously talk to community leaders. And I'll give you a concrete example of what happens frequently. Adolescent girls are so marginalized in some of these population groups. They're kept inside for fear of violence. And what is happening is that we're seeing the age of marriage go right down in these kind of situations. And so child marriage is very much on the increase, particularly in some of these Muslim communities where they feel they fear a worse fate for their girls if they don't get married young. So we try to work with the culture, we try to observe it, but we're also a rights-based group, and some things are wrong. Domestic violence goes up in all these situations, and we speak out against that. It's not right, it's not right in any culture. Uh, can you expand a little bit on your advocacy mm -hmm. work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. So one of the things that we do a lot is to look for gaps in humanitarian assistance, identify needs and problems, and then we take that information and advocate both at the local national levels, but also within the UN system. So for instance, 
Um, we have been absolutely key in helping the US government, the State Department, with what is called their call to action to prevent gender-based violence in emergencies. This is a new initiative that was launched a year ago. We have been collecting evidence, first because around the need for that kind of global initiative that governments buy into and put dollars behind. But the other thing that we've been doing is advocating for other people to join that initiative. This is the kind of thing we do. Why? Because we, if we can scale up that initiative, we have a chance of preventing or at least contributing to the prevention of gender-based violence. So we take what we know, we take it to governments, we take it to the UN, we go to all the high-level meetings and sit there and make noise. This is what our advocacy is. I went to the World Humanitarian Summit. I got up and talked about the need for more programming in gender um, equality in humanitarian settings. I gave them some data. I gave them some numbers. Um, I pushed very hard for more funds for youth programming. So what, what we try to do is to use our voices and take messages that are based on concrete evidence from our research, but also one of the key ways we advocate is to bring the voices of those that are most impacted by crisis, by displacement, and bring those voices to the kind of forum. So we work a lot on, on disabilities. People with disabilities have been excluded from humanitarian services for so long. They don't have access to reproductive health clinics. They don't have access to food because they may be in wheelchairs and they can't cross muddy fields in their wheelchairs. So we have been advocating for disability inclusion across the humanitarian system. And we've been incredibly successful. So at the World Humanitarian Summit, we finally were able to get a charter for disability inclusion signed by, I forget how many, I think it's 40 governments. So that's the kind of thing we do. So we are looking for systemic change um, through our advocacy. Has there been one um, cause that has been more successful than others? You, you mentioned disabilities, but do you find like having a case example or statistics, what works best? I mean, it depends. I mean, I think one of the things that, one of the ways that we've actually made a change um, has been through our rep reproductive health work. We were one of the first um, organizations, going back to the founders, that discovered that women weren't getting any kind of basic reproductive health care. And we built um, you know, we've been working with a coordinated group of agencies to push this forward. This has been very successful. A recent global assessment has shown that in almost half of emergencies, we now have basic reproductive health care. I know that doesn't, it's not good enough. We need to expand and get greater commitment. But if you look back 20 years, there was nothing in place. So that I would say that that has been one of our great successes. Um, it, it's an area that is absolutely fundamental to the survival and well-being of women. If they're not healthy, they can't look after their families, they can't be productive. So this is, this is something that I think we consider it has been very successful. We now have what is called a minimal initial service package, that package we designed with some other agencies. So in an emergency, all humanitarian workers need to look at that package and roll it out. It's expected to be rolled out in the first 24 hours. So it seems to me that there are two sides to the rehabilitation, to the issue of rehabilitation of um, refugees in countries other than their country of origin. Um, on the one hand, it seems that there is a need to provide women with tools for their economic development, but on the other, it seems that there is also a need for social assimilation because you repeatedly hear stories of backlash against the flow of refugees from, from different countries where questions of, of national identity and culture come up. So how do you think that we can deal with that? I think that this is a perfect area for a lot of the NGO world because they are 
working at the grassroots level and have access to refugees, I think that you know, one of the things that we've found that's been incredibly important is working with adolescent girls. As I said, they're the most marginalized. Frequently, they're forced into early marriage. But if we can help them build their social, economic, and human assets at an early age, this really helps them. Um, you know, um, it helps them develop the, the coping mechanisms and very positive coping me mechanisms. We've been able to show that. And I think the work that we've done doing that in partnership with local groups, I think has been extraordinary in actually sort of changing the dynamic. But also, I think building networks, if, if women refugees and men, for that matter, can be more integrated into the communities that are hosting them, so either through um, centers where they can start to exchange ideas, um, talk to each other, because so often the backlash has to do with ignorance, it has to do with fear of violence, it has to do with competition for jobs. And I think if you can break some of that down in safe spaces where people can really talk and feel that they can voice their opinions and get to know refugees, I think that's a huge help. I thank you, Sarah, for yeah. really informing us about what the Women's Refugee Commission does and what we can hope to help thank you with. Thank you for too. the opportunity. Thank you all. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.